So um, we're going to talk more about electrodiagnostics um, today. Last time we started messing with the nervous system rather than just listening to it, and so we talked about stimulating a peripheral nerve and recording um, the evoked response um, from a, a muscle. And if we stimulate a peripheral nerve, we're going to fire all of the motor units, about all of them, within that nerve. And we're going to then evoke a what's called M-wave or compound motor unit action potential. So it's compound because there's multiple motor units all generating their action potentials at, at once. Um, and these all tend to fire synchronously. The, the timing of such things is such that uh, um, all of these tend to fire at once and we'll get this nice clean um, waveform. Now we can't have abnormalities of this M wave if things aren't right. Um, it can be a much smaller amplitude than it should be if there aren't as many motor units firing, either because the, uh, the muscle is, is sick or the axons are gone or there's demyelination blocked. Um, the other thing that can happen is we can get this temporal dispersion, this kind of spreading out of the wave, where rather than having a nice clean wave, um, we get kind of a polyphasic wave, and we'll talk more about that here in a bit. Um, and you may not be able to evoke anything. And when you can't evoke anything, the first thing you do is start messing with the equipment, make sure the amplifier's on, right, Missy? Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, little things like that. Um, and if you, you know, double check, triple check the equipment, sometimes you can go to a different nerve, make sure that's working, stick the needles directly into the muscle, make sure you can make the muscle jump, you know, that the current's working then you can say that the nerve is not conducting at all or the muscle is not responding at all. Now, one of the other things that we'll sometimes do when we're looking at these uh, compound motor unit action potentials is do a repetitive stimulation. So rather than just doing one stimulus, getting a wave, moving on, we'll repeat it over and over again. Now, in a normal muscle, if you stimulate it at a reasonable rate, less than 50 hertz or so, um, each response will be pretty much the same. There's a little bit of variability, but less than 10% variability in the, the amplitude and, and area under the curve for any given wave, no matter how many times you stimulate it. Now with certain diseases, like diseases of the neuromuscular junction in particular, and myasthenia gravis is the classic, um, you get a decremental response where the first wave is normal amplitude, but as you stimulate, each subsequent wave gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So you've, this is the electrophysiological manifestation of the fatigue that's characteristic of myasthenia gravis. With the same stimulus, we start to get less of a response. The, um, the, uh, um, the nerve muscle um, junction fatigues. And what we typically do is compare the difference between the first wave and a couple of subsequent waves. Um, typically, you do the first, fourth, and tenth. So normal, uh, normal gets defined as less than 15% um, variability. If you have more than 15% drop in the waveform, that's a decrement. So this, my <coughs> this myasthenic drop 30, 33% um, in terms of the amplitude area under the curve, which is a little more accurate measure, um, dropped 40-47%. So this tells us that neuromuscular junction can fatigue and uh, indicates that we're dealing with a neuromuscular junction problem. Now the other thing that we use these um, evoked responses, these compound motor units for, is to do a nerve conduction velocity. So to measure the velocity of the nerve, what we're going to do is we're going to stimulate the nerve at different sites. So we'll take, say, for example, the tibial nerve and stimulate it as part of the sciatic up in the ischiatic notch. Then we'll come down and catch the tibial branch um, behind the, the stifle between the heads of the gastrox. And then we'll come down and catch it again just, you know, um, above the hock in the, you know, behind the, uh, um, the Achilles tendon. So we'll stimulate it in three different places. Um, and the latency is from when we stimulate to when we record a response is going to decrease as we get closer to the muscle that we're recording from. So up here, number one would be the stimulation in the hip. It takes a long time for the, the impulse to get all the way down the nerve and produce a contraction. 
as we come closer to the muscle in the stifle, we have less of a latency. When we get down in the hock, where we're real close to the muscle, a very short latency. And so we see this change in the, the latency of the wave. Now we can't just measure latency because obviously the latency from the hip to the inner osseous muscle is going to be very different than a Great Dane versus a Chihuahua. Um, and so what we do is we'll actually calculate the, the velocity. And so the way we'll calculate the velocity in meters per second is the units that we're, we're shooting for. We measure the distance between two of the cathodes. So remember the stimulus is actually going to be at the cathode, so we use those as our measuring point. And we take a ruler and just kind of measure what that distance is between those two stimulation points. And then we look at the difference in latency between the wave that's evoked by stimulating up in the hip here and stimulating down in the stifle there. And we measure to the onset of the wave. So the onset of the wave is going to be the fastest conducting fibers in that you know, group of fibers that are being stimulated. And so we want to know how fast can this nerve possibly conduct. And so if we divide that distance beside, by the difference in latency um, in millimeters and milliseconds, we come up with a conduction velocity in meters per second. And that's, again, the fastest conducting fibers in that um, complex. Now, conduction velocity is largely a function of myelin. You know, we talked about how myelin um, decreases the capacitance and how you can get the saltatory conduction where the, the action potential actually jumps um, from node to node to node. And this is what allows us to have very fast conduction without having axons the size of a giant axon of squids. Um, if we have demyelination, then we've stripped away some of that myelin. And what happens oops, when we strip away that myelin, what happens is the conduction slows through that area because now the capacitance is high, the membrane can store a lot of charge, there aren't that many um, ion channels in there, they're not concentrated in the node, and the conduction slows down to a crawl. Once it hits a myelinated area again, then it picks up and, and goes on at a normal velocity. So with demyelinating diseases, we end up with these patches of areas where the conduction drops way, way down. <clears throat> and this is the thing that leads to um, this concept of temporal dispersion. Um, so the, that demyelination isn't typically going to be, you know, focal and even. You know, there's going to be a patch here, a patch there. And <clears throat> so when we stimulate this entire nerve, the conduction down this branch is going to be a lot different than the conduction down that branch or that branch. And where we stimulate makes a difference as well. So if we stimulate up um, down here, for example, in the hock, this is turned around the other way, we're stimulating the hock on the top, we don't have as many, uh, as far to go, we don't have as many areas where demyelination can occur, and so we get a relatively normal looking compound motor unit action potential. But as we come further up and we stimulate, say, in the stifle, we're going to pick up a few more areas where there's demyelination. Some of those fibers aren't going to conduct as quickly. The fastest one's still conducting pretty fast, but some of them are slowing down and the, the waveform starts to spread out. And then when we get all the way up in the hip and we've got to run through a bunch of demyelinated areas, the waveform gets very jagged because now everything is out of sync. It's not you know, going at the same speed down all the branches of the nerve. Things aren't summating smoothly and we get these polyphasic fit waves or what's called temporal dispersion of the, the waveform. Now, if you have a really bad demyelinating disease, you can actually get conduction block where when the action potential gets to that area, there isn't enough, uh, there's too much capacitance, there's not enough ion channels to carry the, um, the, the action potential further and it kind of peters out as it tries to go through that area. So even though the axon is still intact, the machinery, if you will, is incapable of maintaining an action potential, and we end up you know, having a, a blockage of conduction, even though the axon is, is still there. Now, in this situation, you don't get the fibrillations and positive sharp waves in the muscle because the axon's still there. The nerve is still talking to the muscle, 
the muscle still thinks everything is fine even though it's not getting any signals from the nerve and you don't get um, fibrillations but you do get conduction block and if it's bad enough you can have be unable to elicit a response um, from the the muscle now when we stimulate the nerve in the middle here like this um, we're you know of course going to get an action potential running down the nerve and get our, our M waves um, but this isn't a physiological stimulation. It's not an action potential originating up here and coming down. We're depolarizing it right in the middle of the, the nerve. And so we're also going to generate an action potential that's going to go antidromically up towards the spinal cord unless we've got a really sick nerve and the anodal block is enough to actually block the conduction. But you've got to have a pretty sick nerve before that's going to happen. So in a, a relatively healthy nerve, you're also going to generate an action potential going up towards the cell body, up towards the spinal cord. Now, <clears throat> this will antidromically activate the lower motor neuron. And this is something I've never read a good explanation for how this happens. You know, it's always something magic happens here because when this action potential has come through here, all of these sodium channels should be refractory. You, they shouldn't be able to generate another action potential right away. But somehow they do. And then again, I've never read anything where anybody said, oh, here's why you can antidromically activate a, a nerve like this and it's not refractory. But you can. And so you end up backfiring this neuron, if you will, and you get another action potential coming back down, and that's the, called the F wave. Now, you notice how the latencies, though, are different. Um, when we're stimulating up in the hip, we've got a long latency to the M wave because we got to go all the way down here. But to get that anadromic stimulation, we only have a short distance to go up to the lower motor neuron to backfire it. So the F wave latency is actually shorter than when we move down the leg further. So the F wave and the M wave do this kind of spread apart thing as you're recording them. Now the advantage of this is that it allows us to measure conduction up through the nerve root. And so if you have something like polyradicular neuritis, which is predominantly a nerve root pathology, with that F wave, we're sending an impulse through the nerve root and, and able to record a response. A problem is the F wave is sometimes hard to get under anesthesia, and so that makes a, a, a problem for us. Uh, but if we can get them, we can measure you know, um, uh, conduction velocities once again and uh, you know, see what the, the nerve root is doing. Now, one thing I forgot to mention, when we're doing these, um, these stimuli, what we do is we try to use the minimum current that it takes to fire the, the, the neuron. So we'll get the, the electrodes in the position, we'll turn up the amplitude of the, the uh, current a little bit, move the electrode around until we're getting a good response, and then turn up the current until we get as big of an M wave as we can get. And this is called a super maximal stimulus. So the, the idea is to get this wave as big as you can get, get as close to the nerve as you can get it, and uh, get a nice clean response without a lot of current. <clears throat> now the reason that's important is there's another wave we can record called the H wave, which is named after a guy named Hoffman. I don't know where the M and F come from. They, I've never heard them named after somebody. But here what we're going to do is we're going to turn the, 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 um, the voltage, the current, way, way down on our stimulating electrode. We keep going, turning it down, watching the M wave get smaller and smaller and smaller until it disappears completely. Now once it disappears completely, we know we're not going to get an F wave because we aren't firing the you know, the, the orthodromic, the, the normal direction of the action potential, so we're sure not backfiring the lower motor neuron, but we still get a wave. We get this tiny little wave out here that's even longer latency than the F wave. So what's this? This is the H wave, and this is actually a recording of the myotatic reflex arc. The sensory um, nerves have a lower threshold of firing than the motor nerves. And so we can drop down below that threshold of stimulation to kick on the motor nerves and still get the sensory nerve to fire. That's going to fire an action potential up through the myotatic reflex and down, and we get this H wave or uh, reflex response. 
Um, it's a longer latency because there's a synaptic delay in there. There's a few milliseconds of time that it takes for the neurotransmitter to release and the lower motor neuron to fire. And so this is, again, a way we can, you know, look at nerve roots and look at sensory function and, and uh, you know, actually look at the myotatic reflex and see what it's doing. Now, there's some other reflex responses that we um, sometimes record. Um, we can stimulate the infraorbital nerve in the face here and record from the eyelids and record an eye blink reflex, basically the palpebral reflex. When we stimulate this nerve, we're also going to be stimulating pain afferents from the tooth pulp. And if you are eating a salad and you bite into that uh, olive pit and crack your tooth, there's a reflex that's going to open your jaw right away, kind of a jaw withdrawal reflex, if you will. And so we can also record a blip from the digastricus muscle when we stimulate this nerve. So we can look at the, the trigeminal sensory, facial motor, and trigeminal and, and facial um, motor with these um, reflexes. You can also do a pudendal anal reflex. If you're kinky, you can stimulate the dorsal nerve of the penis or the clitoris and record a response from the anus and, and look at uh, pudendal nerve function. Okay, now we can also um, look at a sensory nerve conduction velocity. This is a little trickier. Um, usually we try to find a pure sensory nerve like the saphenous. Um, we'll stimulate that nerve distally and then record from the, the tibial nerve proximally. Um, often, you know, what we'll do is after we've done, we're done stimulating the nerve, we know we've got the electrodes right next to the nerve. We'll leave those electrodes in there, end up using those as recording electrodes and then try to stimulate the, the, uh, the sensory nerve to, to fire. Um, these are often um, small potentials, um, and, and since we're trying to get it to go the other way, we're going to want to flip the, the stimulating electrodes over so the cathode is, is proximal. Um, these are sometimes small amplitude, um, hard to record, and so what we can do is signal averaging, which is the next topic. Okay, so signal averaging is a technique that we use to extract a small signal from a lot of background noise. Um, usually we're doing this uh, over the brain, recording an EEG signal, so a far field kind of potential. And we're going to stimulate the animal in some way and try to record the response that we've actually evoked in the brain from that stimulus. So here's a, a sweep of an EEG recording. I put a click in the dog's ear right there. Um, and this is the EEG recording. And it's a typical EEG, a bunch of random noise, essentially. And you can't look at that wave and say anything other than, yep, that's an EEG. It's got, you know, this frequency. It's, you know, just a bunch of, you know, random noise. But with signal averaging, what I can do is I can repeatedly put that same stimulus in. So I can click in the dog's ear over and over and over again. And the computer then takes a segment of that EEG that's time locked to every click. So every time it clicks, the computer takes one sweep like this and puts it in memory. And then it takes all the sweeps that you've done, adds them up point to point to point to point to point, and averages them. So we're going to look at what's the averaged response in that signal that's time locked to this stimulus. And that's the key. You've got to be able to time lock it to a stimulus. Um, some people have tried to do olfactory evoked responses and it's a little hard to know, you know when the smell is actually getting in there and stimulating a response. Um, but with something like a click or a light flash, it's, it's pretty easy to, to sync things. So here we've done 10 sweeps. You can see that the waves are changing. You know, some of them are getting smaller, some of them are getting bigger. But still, you're pretty hard pressed to, to pick out the, the signal from the noise. <clears throat> we get up to 100 sweeps. Now we're starting to see some pretty clear peaks. And so we can pull out the portion of the EEG that's actually evoked by the stimulus we're using by this signal averaging technique. Now, one of the things about signal averaging is you want to make sure it's repeatable because sometimes you can get spurious results. So we always do this twice and look at the waves and they should overlie um, uh, you know, perfectly. The other thing you got to do is watch what the, the frequency of your stimulus is. 
So if I stimulated, say put the click in the dog's ear at a six hertz stimulus frequency, I would be picking up some of the 60 hertz noise in the room that way because every, what, tenth wave, I'd be picking up the peak of a, of a, you know, a sine wave that's generated by the electrical noise from the lights. And so we always pick an oddball frequency to stimulate at, 11 hertz or 13 hertz or something like that. So it's not a function of 60. So we avoid 6, 10, 3, 20, those kind of frequencies so that we don't get any contamination from that 60 hertz regular kind of cycle out there. But all this other EEG signal that's in there from the dog, you know, dreaming about chasing cats or, you know, thinking about biting the, the person, poking them with needles, are not going to be related to the click. They average out and we just get these waves that are the, the evoked potential. Now probably where we use this the most is in bear testing and hearing testing. Um, the stimulus we use is a click. If you look at the frequency um, uh, composition of a click, it's got a lot of frequencies in it, a very sudden short duration of a lot of different frequencies. So it stimulates pretty much the entire cochlea, but only for a very brief period. Um, you, you put these uh, earplugs, these are just fancy earphones, you could listen to your iPhone with it if you wanted to. Um, but they're calibrated so we know how much signal generates how many decibels of noise. Um, we put the click in one ear, we'll put white noise in the other, just kind of, you know, seashore kind of noise in the other ear to mask the, the uh, other ear from hearing. And record the evoked response from the, the, what we call the vertex, right over the center of the brain and right under the mastoid process are our reference and recording electrodes. And what we get is these very nice clean waves, usually, um, that represent processing of that click at different levels of the, the nervous system. So there's a first little blip out here that we can actually get rid of through some tricks and, and usually do. Um, that's called the cochlear microphonics. And that's the actual hair cells in the cochlea depolarizing in response to that pressure wave. Then there's the first wave, um, which is the cochlear nerve transmitting that signal into the brainstem. Um, third nerve is uh, the, you know, the brainstem nuclei and then on up. And so we basically get these series of, very, of five very clear distinct waves. Um, the fifth one is followed by this big negative um, potential that always identifies the fifth wave. And these are, are basically looking at this brainstem transmission of that auditory stimulus. So we can use it to determine, did the cochlea even work? Is this dog deaf? Is there a cochlea out there that's functioning and generating any waves? Um, if we're interested in a central demyelinating disease, like something like MS, for example, um, you can use this to measure central conduction times to see if there's demyelination within the central nervous system. And way out here, there are also cortical evoked responses. They're a little bit squishier, a little harder to elicit, particularly when the animal's sedated and we don't usually mess with those too much. Um, we're mainly evaluating the brain stem and really usually what we use this for is just hearing. Can the dog hear? Can we generate any waves? Now we can do the same thing with vision by using a strobe flash. Um, we record from the occipital cortex in this case and we can evoke a visual evoked potential. Now there's also going to be an ERG within that signal that uh, we're going to have to differentiate from what's uh, you know, generated in the cortex. But we can look at the conduction from the retina up to the visual cortex using a visual evoked potential. Now in these evoked potentials, the, the, um, the bear had this one, two, three, four, five um, you know, nomenclature. For the others, the nomenclature is kind of squishy. Um, it, it's not real clear. It depends, you know, there's a lot of different ways this can get um, identified. So you usually define them as P waves and N waves, positive waves and N negative waves. And there's two conventions that are used. Um, one is to simply number them. So this is a visual evoked response and it's labeled as P1, N1, P2, N2, P3, and, and so on. Um, the other way that you'll sometimes see them labeled is based on the latency. So this would be the P about 23 wave. This would be the N about 27 wave. 
this would be the P65 wave, and so on. So you can label it based on the latency of the waves. And both of those have problems. For example, if you're using the P123 waves, and this P wave is way out here because the latency is way um, uh, down, and you don't get any waves after that, how do you know whether that's the P1 wave that's way out here, or did the P1 wave not generate, and that's really the P2 wave that's normal? It gets a little hard sometimes to know what to label. Um, the latency has the same problem. If you've got a slowed conduction, and the, the P45 uh, wave or whatever it is is way out here, do you call that the P100 wave because now it's at, P, at 100 milliseconds? So it, 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 it gets to be kind of a nomenclature conundrum with these, you know, with these uh, evoked potentials. And often the waves aren't nearly as distinct as with the brainstem. Um, we can also do somatosensory evoked responses where we can stimulate the peripheral nerve send an impulse all the way up to the spinal cord, um, to the brain, and record from the uh, somatosensory cortex. Or we can put the electrodes down by the spinal cord and record what's called a cord dorsum potential, which is the, um, the, the, the way that's being generated from stimulating a peripheral nerve when it gets up to the spinal cord there. Um, these kind of recordings are sometimes used to evaluate Claudia Quina function for lumbosacral disease. Bjorn May did a lot of work on this over in, in Holland. Um, so it's a way we can record, you know, somatosensory um, function. Now, another technique that was used some, um, and it's kind of fallen out of favor because it's, it's difficult, um, and it uh, turns out the information isn't as valuable as people hoped it would be, is a motor evoked response to assess spinal motor tracks. So everything we've been doing so far is sensory, putting in a sensory stimulus recording from the sensory cortex. But with the advent of magnetic stimulation, where you can use a very strong magnetic field to stimulate neurons deep within the, the brain, um, people were able to do a motor evoked response where they put one of these mag stim things over the dog's brain, run current through the brain, Theoretically, depolarize the cortex, but this is always a question mark whether we're really depolarizing the cortex or depolarizing something like the red nucleus. Just what are we depolarizing to generate these, um, these responses? But the bottom line is we can stimulate something, um, get a potential going down the spinal cord, and evoke a jerk of the dog, a little myoclonic jerk. That's this motor evoked response. And we can record that jerk in the muscles and measure a latency and, and look at you know motor conduction times. Or if the if we don't want the the jumping of the dog um, obscuring things, or this was sometimes used in uh, it, you know the the hope was this would be used a lot in neurosurgical procedures where you want to make sure you're not damaging the cord during the neurosurgery and you don't want the dog you know, jumping when you're um, in there, you know, with scalpel blades and things right next to the spinal cord. Um, so you can paralyze the dog and record from the peripheral nerve and record the action potential coming down the peripheral nerve in response to this. The problem is this proved to be very technically difficult to do um, and get a consistent response. Um, and so it, it's, you know, it never caught on in spinal surgery like the, the people who developed it thought it, it would. Okay, so for the remainder of the time, we're going to switch gears and talk about electroencephalography. Um, remember with the EEGs, we're recording what are called far, far field potentials. We're far away from where the generators of these electrical fields are. And so the way to think about the EEG is that it's just kind of cortical noise. Um, the best analogy I've ever heard is that it's like you've got a party going on and you put a decibel meter in the middle of a room at the party and you don't even look what the noise level is, but you just look at how the needle is fluctuating on the, the decibel meter. So that's kind of what the EEG is like. There's all these you know, field shifts, the, the sink source things that are going on way down here in the cortex. We're not looking at individual action potentials or anything, but just how much noise is generated from all that activity going on down there in the brain. Now, to set up an EEG, the first thing you do is pick a, mont a montage, and the montage is the, 
the organization of the electrodes on the surface of the, the scalp. Where are you going to put your electrodes? And there are a number of different montages that have been developed. Um, and this is probably the simplest one that was developed by Redding back in the 70s, where you just have five electrodes, one, in, two, one over each frontal area, one at the vertex right in the middle, and one over each occipital area. And then we again do differential amplification. So the first um, line that we're seeing here is amplifying the difference between the left frontal and the center. Second is the right frontal versus the center, left occipital versus the center. Uh, or no, I'm sorry, they, he's doing it left, um, left, right, occipital, left, right, frontal. But you know, each corner against the vertex, and then you know, down the left side, down the right side, across the front and across the back. So we have these pairings of electrodes that have different orientations and are going to amplify the differences in the noise level between those two areas of the brain. Now you can do a referential recording and put a reference out on the nose and, and compare everything to that, but that's not usually done. There are more complex montages out there. This is the one that Pellegrino um, developed where you try to put a lot more electrodes in, try to get down near the temporal lobe. Um, you know, these, you know, give you better recordings, but there are a lot of more work to, to get lined up, and, and I just use the simple reading montage because it, it's simple and quick. Now, the other thing that influences the EEG is the recording um, conditions. Um, <clears throat> this is a gower. It's a, uh, a uh, wild cattle species from Southeast Asia and these guys were having seizures and we recorded them in a, a barn at the St. Louis Zoo and it was one of the most beautiful clean recordings I've ever gotten because we were in this barn that had its own wiring. There was no electrical noise anywhere from anything. Um, so that was beautiful. And the, the animal was in a stock, it couldn't move. You know, cattle have big flat areas on the top of their skull with no muscles, so there's no muscle artifact. Um, we got beautiful recordings. Um, but usually we don't get that good. Um, often we have to at least sedate the animal, if not have them under anesthesia to, to get rid of some of the artifacts we're gonna talk about. Um, but of course, giving the animal any kind of drug you know, changes the, the brain activity. Um, it can change the seizure threshold and can abolish the seizure activity. So it's always a trade-off. We would rather record awake, um, but you know, often that doesn't work in our species. Because if we try to record awake, this is usually what we get, is a whole bunch of artifact. Um, here's a dog who's chewing um, while he's, um, and so you've got a bunch of muscle artifact and movement artifact as his jaw is um, chewing. Um, you can see the, the movement artifact down here. Um, this dog is just very tense and we're recording all the, all we're seeing here is basically EMG activity from the masticatory muscles. So with all that EMG activity, I can't tell what the baseline noise in the brain is because it's obscured by all of this um, artifact. Um, so that's why we typically have to at least sedate the dogs with dexmedetomidine or something like that, if not put them under general anesthesia. Now we can also get some electrical artifact. 60 hertz noise from the lights is the, the, the biggest one. We can filter that out with a notch filter. Um, but much better off trying to get rid of the noise, shut off the fluorescent lights, that sort of thing. We'll look at what equipment anesthesia is using and so on. Sometimes, though, the electrodes will be bad and they'll generate noise um, on their own. So this here is just an electrode that doesn't have good impedance, that isn't in good, and we're getting these big jumps in the baseline because, you know, it's, it's just not, either the electrode is bad or it's not placed properly. This really high frequency, low voltage stuff that you see in these electrodes here that all of a sudden um, go away um, is called electrode noise. I've never really gotten, you know, dug into where that noise comes from. Um, but it means that there's, again, just a bad connection. It has this really high frequency kind of sound to it when you um, amplify it. And it just says that that electrode's not right. We need to change it out or reposition it or, or do something about it. Now we can also get artifact, other artifacts from the dog. Um, here's an EKG recording going along here, and we've got the EKG in every single lead that we're recording from. 
So, you know, we can sometimes pick up the EEG. One of the ideas behind that differential amplification is to get rid of this signal because this is a, you know, two and a half millivolt signal and we're looking for, you know, a few microvolt kind of signals up in the EEG. And usually the differential amplification gets rid of it, but occasionally we'll get some EKG contamination and you don't want to misinterpret that as an epileptic spike or something like that. This is another artifact that we see often if the animal's not completely under, um, under anesthesia. Um, and these are eye movements. So the eye has a big charge across it because the retina is charged, the cornea is not. So anytime the eye moves, that's going to make a big blip in this field that we're recording from, particularly in the frontal lobes. Often there'll be a little twitch in, before the eye movement because often the animals will move their eyelids as they move their eyes and will pick up a little muscle activity from the eyelids. But these kind of, you know, sine wave sort of, you know, movements and often preceded by a little sharp spike that's a EMG spike are eye movements. And you don't want to misinterpret those because you'll see in a minute they look like abnormal stuff. Okay, so a normal EEG, um, in an awake animal, there is low voltage fast activity. So this is what it looks like in an, in an awake animal. Very fine, fast fluttering of the baseline. If we go back to our party analogy, this is when the party's in full swing and there's a constant din of noise. So everybody's talking, everybody's doing stuff, and if you look at that needle, the decibel levels may be way high, but the needle is just sitting there fluttering because no individual noise makes much difference in the background noise level because everything is so noisy. And that's what happens during uh, you know, wakefulness. All the neurons are chatting with each other, generating a lot of fields that average each other out, and we just get these fine flutters. Um, this is also called desynchronized um, activity because none of these um, events are, are big enough to create a big blip in the baseline noise. Now when the animal calms down and goes to sleep, or if we're dealing with a neonate, a young dog who's not fully demyelinated, not fully mature yet, then it's kind of like the party's dying down a little bit. You know, people are starting to wander out, everybody's getting tired, nobody's chatting anymore. And so any noise that is made makes a bigger difference in that baseline needle position. So again, it doesn't matter that the overall noise level's gone down, it's just what does an individual noise do to the needle? And so if we had a decibel meter sitting in the middle of the room now, anytime I say something, the needle will go bloop because there's not a lot of background noise there. But if you guys were all chatting, I could go now and, and nothing would happen because the background noise was so big. So we get higher voltage, slower waves in what's called a desynchronized um, pattern. Okay, so most of what we're looking for when we're looking at the EEG is excessive synchronization of the activity. And this can take a, a number of forms. Um, we can see what are called spindles, which are these crescendo, decrescendo kind of waves, where it just kind of goes um, If there's a lot of slow activity in the background, these can get superimposed on other waves, and it's a little harder to see that nice, uh, you know, crescendo, decrescendo kind of a, a uh, pattern. Um, these are normal during some phases of sleep. When you're transitioning between phases of sleep, you'll get these spindles. When you get whole bunches of them like that, that's not normal. Um, that was actually a recording that um, I did with Jeff Wilkie on uh, looking at lidocaine toxicity in dogs. We, he was figuring out what's the toxic dose of lidocaine, um, and we pushed the dogs to toxicity and, and seizures, and that's what the EEG looked like when these dogs were getting ready to start seizing. Excessive synchronization that has this crescendo, decrescendo kind of pattern. Um, the thing we're usually looking for is this, epileptic discharges. Now, epileptic discharges can take two forms, um, spikes and sharp waves, and <clears throat> these are spikes. Um, they're very sharp um, deviations. Um, basically, you know, the, each phase is the same. You know, the downstroke and the upstroke tend to be um, about the same. Um, they're you know, less than 100 milliseconds duration. Um, they could be isolated single, like that, 
or they can come in runs like this. Um, this would be a polyspike complex is what you would call it. Um, if you have wider waves where there's a lot more daylight between the, the uh, upstroke and the downstroke, more than 100 milliseconds, they're called sharp waves. Um, but the bottom line is these are epileptic um, discharges. Now, sometimes if you're not recording near the, um, the, the origin of the discharge, you'll get blunter waves that, that aren't as clearly spikes. And these are the things that are really hard to interpret because sometimes normal, you know, slow activity can look like that too. Um, but if you see these kind of spikes, this is a seizure. It's the hallmark of a seizure. Now what's happening here is the neurons of the cortex are organized into columns. So you've got these big pyramidal cells um, and you know, when you look at them histologically, they look like they're all just kind of lined up in a row. But if you look at them functionally and, and even you know, anatomically with, with the right kind of stains, um, you can see that there are these columns that are all kind of linked together and that tend to function together. <clears throat> and when you get one of these epileptic spikes, if you were to stick an electrode into one of those neurons in that column and look at what's happening to it, it would be undergoing what's called the paroxysmal depolarization shift. So all of a sudden, for reasons that are still debated, um, it has to do with calcium currents and, and, and things, these neurons just shift into a depolarized state, stay there, and generate a whole run of action potentials. Now, the spike that we're recording isn't an individual action potential because we're way out there in the far field, but that creates a big sink source, you know, current flow within that column, and the, all these neurons in this column do this all together, and that's what generates this epileptic spike. So if we go back to our party analogy, um, it's like there's a party going on, but all of a sudden a bunch of rowdies in the corner all start clapping together. And every time they clap, they make this big noise that can override the baseline noise, and you get this big blip in the, um, the needle on the decibel meter. And that is basically a, an epileptic spike. Now, um, the previous recording you saw was a generalized seizure. Those spikes were recording everywhere. Um, they can start in a localized area with a focal seizure. So here's the frontal against the center, CZ is uh, another term for vortex, uh, vertex. So the left frontal is pretty quiet, the right frontal has a lot of epileptic spikes, the left occipital is very quiet, the right occipital has a few of these spikes, but they're much bigger in the, 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 uh, the, the frontal lobe. So based on this recording, we would say that the epileptic, the seizure activity is coming somewhere around where that right frontal um, electrode is located. And superimposing that on the MRI, we can see we've got some dilated ventricles on that side. This dog's obviously suffered some brain damage on that side. And so we've got a focal um, epileptic discharge there. Now, that other recording that you saw was this same dog a few minutes later. Um, so a focal discharge like that can spread, it can spread from the generator, this would be the, the, uh, the, the right frontal lead here, and it can you know, spread into other parts of the cortex and create a generalized seizure. So, but if we're, if we're lucky enough to catch the focal onset on an EEG, we might see this spiking in a localized area of the, of the brain. Now, another pattern of, of seizure activity that's very important in human medicine is the, the spike and wave activity. Um, this is characteristic of petit mal or absence seizures, the kids who just and then go out about their business as if nothing had happened. Those are petit mal or absence seizures. Sometimes they'll do a little bit of myoclonic jerking or blinking during them, but pretty much they just blank out. And they have this characteristic 6 hertz spike and wave activity on the EEG. Um, this is the only well-documented case of that type of seizure activity in a dog. It was Roberto Palma's case report. Um, these are classic spike and waves, where you've got a spike and then a wave, a spike and then a wave, a spike and then a wave. 
And you can see how this could be confused easily with that eye movement stuff, because you get a little spike, but the, the um, EMG is very fast. You're not going to have any daylight between the upstroke and the downstroke at this sweep speed with an EMG. Whereas a, a true epileptic spike, the, there's always going to be a little bit of, of daylight between there. And so that's how you differentiate them. Plus, you know, um, I can't remember what the recording situation was for this guy, whether he was under anesthesia or, or what, but you know, you, by doing anesthesia, you can abolish any movements in muscle activity. But this is the classic spike and wave kind of pattern, which says this is absence um, epilepsy. Now, the major value of EEG is in differentiating seizures from other episodic things. Um, so we're recognizing a lot more paroxysmal dyskinesias, dystonias, those sort of things now, that we used to just say, oh, this is some kind of strange seizure, um, but now we know they're not, they're, they're different. Um, they would not have seizure activity on the EEG. The problem with that is, you know, you can have a dog who's had a generalized tonic-clonic seizure right in front of you, you saw it, you know that dog had a seizure, record an EEG and it's perfectly normal. And the same thing happens in human medicine where they can do everything right, they can, you know, record long periods of time, sometimes 24 hours, um, they can get the people to relax and not try to pull their electrodes out and, you know, everything else. And still, you know, in about 30, 40% of human epileptics, they cannot record a seizure discharge on the EEG. And for us trying to do this where we have to sedate the dog at least, if not anesthetize them and try to record it, um, it's often a real crapshoot whether we're going to, you know, get a discharge or not on our EEG. So if we get one, if it looks like that last one there, and that dog had some bizarre episodes, that was one of the nice things about that dog. Um, if we see that, we can say, yeah, this dog's having seizures, no doubt, those are seizures, okay? If we don't see it, we shrug our shoulders and say, well, I don't see anything, but I can't say for sure, because I didn't see anything, and a lot of times we don't see anything. Um, but still, if we got a dog like Dawson, the one you saw there, who was having these strange episodes where he would just kind of freeze and he would start walking in slow motion and um, do strange things, we could say, yeah, this dog is, is having a seizure, I can see it. I also had generalized seizures too, and, and then when you see that, you know too. The other real value of the EEG is in the, the dog like we had in ICU yesterday. You know, we have a dog who's in status epilepticus. Um, you know, the seizures have stopped, and you know, the convulsions have stopped. But the question is, have the seizures stopped? Is the brain still seizing? Um, this is an EEG from a dog, Daisy, belonged to one of our vet students. Um, I can't remember her first name. Last name was Umfries. Um, she came home one day, the dog was seizing on her kitchen floor. The young Jack Russell Terrier, she scooped the dog up, ran into the emergency clinic with him. By the time they, she got there, the dog wasn't convulsing anymore. But he was still unconscious, he was still comatose. So he hooked him up to an EEG, and he's still got spikes going on there. So even though he's not convulsing anymore, his brain is still seizing. And so we can have this non-convulsive status epilepticus where you get an electrical mechanical dissociation, the brain is still seizing, you're still getting excitotoxic damage to the brain from those seizures, but the dog is not convulsing anymore. And so this is another place where the EEG is real valuable. If we don't see this, we can't say for sure there's not seizure activity there, but if we see this, we can say, yeah, there's still seizures there, we need to be treating this dog aggressively, even if he's not in a full-blown rock and roll tonic-clonic um, convulsion. Now, I love this. This is from a journal called the Journal of Irreproducible Results, which was published in Harvard back in the 70s and 80s. And this was from the Clinician's Guide to Equivocation on EEG Reports. And they said, EEG correlates have been described for every known neurologic disease, mostly published by assistant professors coming up for tenure. And it used to be that the EEG was kind of our divining rod that we would use to try to see if there was brain disease because we didn't have the nice imaging. And so we're trying to see what the brain is doing, trying to see what's going on. And, you know, people would try to correlate changes in the EEG with tumors and you know, encephalitis and everything else because it was the only way we could, uh, um, could tell. Now, there are a few things that do have very characteristic EEG patterns. And one of them is hydrocephalus. 
Um, and this is a very classic hydrocephalus pattern, very large voltage, slow waves. Often there'll be poly spikes in there as well. I mean, it's called a hypsorrhythmia pattern. Um, and it was considered the, the hallmark of hydrocephalus. Only this dog has sphingolipidosis. He doesn't have hydrocephalus. Um, so really, it's deafferentation of the cortex. So in hydrocephalus, the, gray, the white matter is more susceptible to the pressure than the gray matter. So you wipe out all the white matter, and you're often left with this rim of gray matter that still generates activity, but there's no coordination to it. There's no communication with other areas. It's just doing its own thing. And you get this kind of you know, slow wave activity, about one hertz baseline, and some spikes you know, superimposed on it. And that's classic hydrocephalus pattern, but you know, sphingolipidosis also demyelinates because you're getting you know, myelin um, metabolism problems there. And so it, it's not pathic mnemonic by, by any means. Um, there are things reported with um, encephalitis, and the last thing that we, you know, we really, you only do something like this if the client needs to see a piece of paper that says, yes, your dog is dead. Um, and in human medicine, it's the same thing. You know, a physician can tell when somebody is dead. You know, it's, it's not that hard anymore. Um, brain dead. But often for medical legal reasons, they need a piece of paper that says, yes, this person is brain dead. And so they'll do an EEG, and if you get an EEG that looks like this, there's no activity in that brain. And that, that is, is basically um, brain death. Okay, so what I wanted you guys to get out of this is to, you know, understand the basic principles of what we do with this um, uh, electrodiagnostics. Um, I didn't really get too much into the application. We'll get into that when we get into individual diseases and stuff. Um, and, you know, talk about, you know, where we use this. Um, but you need to understand the kind of information that we can get from the electrodiagnostics and, and, and why it's going to be a, a valuable technique. And we'll quit there. <laughs> See you tomorrow.